Hi, uh, it's Daniel Karapkin here speaking to you from Beth Avram Yosef in Toronto in Thornhill, Ontario in Canada. And uh, we are recording live for yeshiva, webyeshiva.org. Our class is called Moren Vuchim, Maimonides Guide for the Perplexed. We've been doing this for a number of years and we are using the Shlomo Pines edition to help us get through the text. We are in section two, chapter 15 today. Um, and I find this chapter to be fascinating because um, after we learned chapter 14, where the Rambam presents different possibilities um, as far as uh, the, in chapter 13, different models for uh, how the, you know, the origins of our universe and presented the third possibility is that of Aristotle. Aristotle is, um, believes in an eternal universe. That is to say that he does not believe that there ever was a creation, that everything as it is today, it has always been that way. He believes that for a number of reasons, and those reasons were, were presented by the Rambam in chapter 14. Why, according to Aristotle and his students, it is absolutely necessary to believe in the eternality of the universe, whether you argue based on the state of physics as we find it today, or the state of motion that we find today, or whether you argue based on God's essence, which is essentially immutable. And therefore, if, you're, if the God who is responsible for all of existence is unchanging, then it is not possible that at some time, at some point in time, God decided to change from being a passive God to an active God of creation. Well, all of that was presented in the last couple of chapters. And now the Rambam has to begin to dismantle the argument of Aristotle because it clearly is in direct contradiction to the biblical account of creation. And the Rambam, even though he's an Aristotelian philosopher, he is first and foremost a loyal follower of the Torah and of the precepts of Judaism. And although he seeks to reconcile the, the two, the study of Aristotelian philosophy and the study of Torah, whenever there is a conflict, he must either explain Aristotle differently or come up with a way that in this one area, either Aristotle or the students of Aristotle are mistaken. The reason why I find this chapter fascinating is that the Rambam really uh, does not wish to. It becomes clear throughout the Morin of Uchim that he wishes to minimize any kind of dissent against Aristotle. And he shows tremendous deference and respect to, uh, to an author whom he, the Rambam considers to be virtually infallible in the correctness of his thinking. Um, and as such, he's really, he has to really um, find a, a very interesting maneuver in order to explain how the Aristotle could have been so wrong about the origins of the universe. And uh, chapter 15 really is the Rambam on the one hand defending Aristotle and at the same time demonstrating how wrong the belief in an eternal universe is. Um, and um, it's, it's, um, it's a fascinating chapter because as we'll see, it involves the Rambam separating the students of Aristotle from Aristotle himself. And it's a fascinating exercise in polemics. Um, and uh, and I, I, I'm going to show you the handout that I have for today's Shi'ur because I feel that this handout is, um, I think hopefully will be very helpful for you. Um, if you don't uh, have it uh, readily available to you, it's downloadable from the webyeshiva.org website in the course description for today's uh, shiur on chapter 15 in section two. You can also go to the Facebook group shiur, shiur in Morena Vuchim and easily uh, download it from there. But I'm going to be placing it here on the screen for those who are watching via video. And point number one, uh, and first of all, I have a quote up here at the top of the sheet, which is from directly a quote from um, th this chapter which I think is a great quote, words to live by. Passions get the better of all sects, even of the philosophers. And what the Rambam is going to be pointing out to us today is that if you're a chassid 
if you're a real student of Aristotle, sometimes you can get carried away with your fervor of being a fan, of being uh, of throwing yourself at the feet of Aristotle and get carried away by interpreting his words to an even greater degree than the author himself had even meant. Um, and so, and even philosophers who are the epitome of rationalism can sometimes get carried away by their passions. And, uh, and if that's true uh, uh, for people who are extremely rational in their thought, it certainly is true for, uh, for so many other sectors of people as we'll talk a little bit about later. So the first point that the Rambam wants to raise, and this is sort of certainly the, the most important point of this chapter, is that Aristotle has not proven the eternal universe model. Even though Aristotle argues for it and says that it's the most logical way of explaining the history of the, of the universe, but he does not prove it in the classical or conventional sense of what we would call a philosophical proof. And furthermore, he himself, Aristotle, acknowledges that while he's drawn to this argument, it remains unproven. There, the Rambam is going to try and point to a number of texts where he feels this point needs to come, uh, needs to be extracted. And he's also going to point out in the ensuing uh, paragraphs how uh, he is at odds with certain interpreters of Aristotle who maintain that Aristotle did feel that he had proven this point. Point number three, and, and the Rambam himself uh, tries to argue that if you're going to make a claim about what Aristotle has proven, you would also need to present the proofs that Aristotle presents for the thing that he purportedly has proven. Because Aristotle is the great teacher of how to prove things scientifically. And if you cannot demonstrate where he has utilized his own methodology in proving something, then you cannot uh, justifiably say that he has proven something. Just because Aristotle makes a claim and makes a statement, if he does not present philosophical proofs for that statement, then you cannot say that he has proven it. And therefore, he has not abided by his own rules in arguing for an eternal universe. And that's one of the arguments as to how the Rambam feels confident that even Aristotle was unsure about the origins of the universe, about cosmogony. Now, the Rambam examines the language of Aristotle's assertion from the following two passages. Uh, what the, the way the, Ram, the quotes appear in the guide is a little bit different from the way that we have them translated directly from the Greek into English. What I've done, therefore, is that you uh, presumably you have the text of the Moren of Uchim available to you, but I've extracted the two quotes as they are from the original texts in the works of Aristotle themselves. And by the way, um, Aristotle's works are available online uh, in wiki quotes, you can get, or wiki texts, you can get um, all of Aristotle's writings translated into English. They're sometimes difficult English, they're sometimes difficult to decipher, but we will try our best. The, the first text, these are short paragraphs. One is from Aristotle's work called Physics in chapter eight, part one. But so far as time is concerned, we see that all, with one exception, are in agreement in saying that it is uncreated. So the first statement that Aristotle makes is that everybody agrees that time is eternal. And remember, we had said in the previous chapter, if time is eternal, then space must also be eternal because they are intertwined in Aristotelian philosophy. In fact, it is just this that enables Democritus, another earlier philosopher, to show that all things cannot have had a becoming. They were never created. For time, he says, is uncreated. So who's the one, Yotze Dofan, who's the one who disagrees with this and believes in creation? Aristotle says Plato alone asserts the creation of time, saying that it had a becoming together with the universe the universe, according to him, having had a becoming. So therefore, Plato believes in the creation of time. He therefore also believes in the creation of space, or if you remember from chapter 13, 
he believes in the creation of formed space. In other words, there was formless matter that pre-existed creation, and the creator simply added form to that formless matter. That's what Plato believes, and that's what caused the creation of time as well. So without getting too much into that argument, what's curious about this is that Aristotle does not just simply put forward that he believes in the fact that the universe is eternal or uncreated, but rather he starts off by saying that everyone is in agreement saying that it is uncreated, and he quotes Democritus by name, and the only one who disagrees is Plato. So before we go into our second text, the, Ram, the, the Rambam infers four arguments to show that Aristotle was not convinced of his assertion. This is the, the numbering that I've counted in the chapter, although he doesn't itemize them specifically as four arguments. But let's look at his first two arguments based on this passage from, the, from his work called Physics. Number one, if Aristotle had been convinced that he had proven this and that he really knows that this is this to be true, he would not have had to buttress his opinion by citing that most others agreed with him. And the argument that the Rambam gives, and this is a direct quote from the Mora, for when something has been demonstrated, the correctness of the matter is not increased and certainty regarding it is not strengthened by the consensus of all men of knowledge with regard to it. In other words, why do you have to say, Aristotle, that everyone agrees to the fact that the universe is eternal? Why not just make the statement without using this argument that everyone agrees to this fact? Um, you don't seem to be buttressing or supporting or bolstering your argument just because everyone agrees with it. If something is true, it's true regardless if one person believes it to be true or a million people believe it to be true. So that's, that gives rise to suspicion in the eyes of the Rambam. Number two, nor would he have had to assiduously disprove and disparage those who disagreed with his model. And as the Rambam states in his own language, nor could its correctness be diminished and certainty regarding it be weakened if all the people on the earth disagree with it. If everyone disagrees with something, but it's nonetheless true, its truthfulness is not diminished by the fact that the rest of the world doesn't believe in it. Now, this is the, there's sort of two sides of the same coin. So why then, O oh, Aristotle, would the Rambam argues, why Aristotle did you have to spend time even deflecting Plato's argument of creation? There was no need for you to argue against it. Just say, we believe in the eternality of the universe based on the following proofs without bringing in people who agree with you, people and, and deflecting or you know uh, disproving those who disagree with you. Now, I do want to point out, and it's quite curious that the Rambam seems to be ignoring this, is that in, in last week's chapter, chapter 14, the Rambam had provided nine arguments cited by, uh, by either Aristotle or Aristotle's students to argue for the eternity of the universe. The ninth and final argument was what we would call the argument by consensus. And that is that the uh, Aristotle was of the belief that if the majority or, or the consensus of mankind was to believe in something, then that in itself indicates that that universal or consensus belief has truth to it. And the way we tried to present it was that since man acquires intellect from the heavens on some level, uh, and, and that the heavens influence man's intellect, as we'll talk about, and we've discussed this idea of the active intellect before, that sometimes we believe in, uh, Aristotelian belief is that there are celestial entities that can influence man's thinking, then why would it be that if something was false, that it would be that the most of humankind would subscribe to that belief or idea. The Rambam seems to be ignoring that. The Rambam seems to be saying that that's not true, that no matter how many people believe in something or don't believe in something, its truth is not affected. If it's absolutely true scientifically, 
and it's, you know, that the world has no beginning, then it doesn't make a difference whether most people believe in it or not. And he seems therefore to be arguing against the ninth of the nine arguments from the previous chapter. But that's, so, so that's the first point that the Rambam makes is that you're seeing a dent in the armor of Aristotle's proof to the eternality of the universe by virtue of the fact that he seems to be invoking a, a whole gr a, a group of cheerleaders on his side to bolster his argument. Well, if you believe that you are correct and that your argument is victorious, you don't need other people to buttress that argument. That's argument. That's the first text that the Rambam points to, to show that Aristotle himself does not believe that he's completely proven it. The second text is from a book called On the Heavens, which is also known as um, uh, the Kalo is the, is, the, is the Greek term, and it's from chapter one, uh, part 10. And uh, Aristotle writes as follows, having established these distinctions, we may now proceed to the question whether the heaven is ungenerated or generated, indestructible or destructible. Is, was the world ever created or not? And is the world or the universe subject to ceasing to exist? Let us start with a review of the theories of other thinkers, for the proofs of a theory are difficulties for the contrary theory. So what I want to present you first, says Aristotle, is let me tell you what other people believe before I tell you what I believe. And the reason is because their view is going to present difficulties from my point of view. So I want to share with you what they have to say before you hear what I have to say. Besides, those who have first heard the pleas of our adversaries will be more likely to credit the assertions which we are going to make. We shall be less open to the charge of procuring judgment by default. To give a satisfactory decision as to the truth, it is necessary to be rather an arbitrator than a party to the dispute. In other words, I wish to be as impartial as possible. I don't want you to feel that I am biased towards a certain belief simply because I have a predisposition to a certain way of thinking and I'm prejudiced. No, I want to show you that I am perfectly aware of the other side. I want to be able to present their arguments to show you where they are wrong so that you'll be able to, I'll have more credibility in showing you that, I am, that my assertion is correct regarding the eternality. So therefore, the Rambam sort of in introducing, sorry, Aristotle, in his effort to introduce his belief in the eternality of the universe, says, I'm going to present you the Platonic view first, the idea of creation, so that you'll give more credence to my argument towards the contrary, which is the eternity of the universe. So to this, the Rambam writes as follows. The last two arguments from this second passage of On the Heavens is like this. The first question that the Rambam raises is, why is a true argument made weaker when one has not heard the opposing side? This is a form of rhetoric which has no place in proving truth. Why is it necessary for a philosopher to first present the opposing side before he presents to you the truth? We don't find that in Aristotle a lot. Now, I find it quite ironic that the Rambam is raising this argument because the Morena Vuchim is filled with beliefs that the Rambam himself does not subscribe to, and he goes to great extents to present them in order to, so that we would understand that it's not because of his ignorance of those ideas, but rather because of his deep knowledge of those ideas that he disagrees with them. We saw several chapters at the end of part one of Moren Nebuchim, where the Rambam presents very robustly the beliefs of the Mutakalimun and the atomists in their understanding of the existence of reality. And the Rambam spent a lot of time disproving them so that we would understand that he does know what he's talking about because he knows the opposing arguments. But apparently the Rambam says, why is it only here that Aristotle goes to such great extents to rhetorically present us with the opposing side? Why is it only when it comes to the eternal universe theory 
that the, that Aristotle feels he needs to go and talk about, I'm going to tell you what the opposing side says so that you'll understand that I'm not biased or prejudiced. I'm willing to hear the other side and let's hear what they have to say. And number two, Aristotle calls his theory of the eternal universe assertions and not the language of absolute proofs and demonstrations, which is why we have in the quote the word assertions or theories perhaps would be another possible word. So that's another argument, says the Rambam, as to why you see in the text of Aristotle itself a certain hesitation or certainly a lack of proof that the universe is eternal. From the above, we conclude that Aristotle was merely arguing that his theory made more sense based on logic and scientific investigation than the other theories of creation. Rambam agrees with Aristotle on this count that examining science today and extrapolating from it leads one to conclude like Aristotle. In other words, using a methodology of examining scientifically the physical world and the metaphysical realm and extrapolating from it, it certainly is logical to conclude using the arguments from the previous chapter that the universe is eternal. Why then do I not subscribe to it, says the Rambam, as I will argue in chapter 17, two chapters from now, extrapolation from what currently exists is not always the most correct inference to make. Just because things are the way they are presently does not mean that you can extrapolate going back in infinitely in time and saying that they have always been this way. That's going to be the Rambam's argument against Aristotle. But the point that Rambam wants to make here now is in this chapter is that even Aristotle could not prove the eternity of existence. What he was merely saying is, I'm aware that there is a theory of, there's a good argument to be made for the eternity of the universe. There's an, a good argument to be made that the universe at one time was created. Based on my observation sci uh, scientifically of what exists now, it makes more sense to conclude that the universe has always eternally existed, but we cannot prove it. Often, and here now the Rambam gets into another idea, which is that if we look at the students of Aristotle, those that followed him and elaborated upon his writings, like Alexander of Aphrodisius and a great litany of Islamic philosophers, and he's going to mention Al-Farabi by name in just a moment, often the followers of a wise man are biased to the point where they will argue more fervently than the wise man himself. And that's where he writes, passions get the better of all sects, even of the philosophers. That is why Aristotle's followers argue that he proved eternality when even Aristotle himself admitted that he had not. A belief, uh, Aristotle believed, and this is point number 11, that the ways of proving this theory have their gates closed before us, there being no foundation on which to build up the proof. In other words, uh, for the Rambam to go back uh, ad infinitum into the history or the origins of the universe is not something that we can do with any reliability from a scientific or philosophical perspective to be able to prove anything one way or the other. Aristotle believed that. And this is the point, this is sort of the main thrust of this whole chapter, is that when you wanna go back eons and eons in time and to determine what was and what was not, you simply cannot do so reliably based on the tools or the resources that are available to us intellectually. Aristotle also explicitly states that the question of an eternal universe is unresolved in another work of Aristotle. So this is the third work that the Rambam is referencing of Aristotle called Topica or Topics, section, uh, uh, chapter one, section 11. And here, I don't find this to be a very strong argument, um, but the Rambam feels that it is explicit in the words of Aristotle. And we'll just read the paragraph together. A dialectical problem is a subject of inquiry that contributes either to choice and avoidance or to truth and knowledge. In other words, if I have a dilemma, where is it A or B? Is it up or down? So this is a, this is a dialectical problem, which means it's a, a question which has can either be one thing or the other thing. It's, it's, got, it's got to be either or. It's an either or question. 
And it'll help once I resolve that doubt, I will either know what is good for me and what is bad for me, what I should choose and what I should avoid, or I will know what is true and what is false. And that either by itself or as a help to the solution of some other such problem. For some problems, it is useful to know with a view to, to choice or avoidance, e.g. whether pleasure is to be chosen or not. In other words, I may not know a certain food may present itself as something that I may want to taste to see whether it's something that I like or I don't like. So that's where I may venture into this dialectical problem by just tasting it. And then I'll be able to know whether it's desirable or undesirable or whether I should choose it or not. While some, it is useful to know merely with a view to knowledge. For example, whether the universe is eternal or not. There are some things which I wish to investigate, not because they may, uh, not, not for personal gratification purposes, but rather to satisfy the question for pure knowledge sake, such as, is the universe eternal or not? That's the entire quote. And the Rambam sees in this that Aristotle is not sure whether the universe is eternal or not. It seems, he seems to be implying that it's unresolved. It's a dialectical problem for which we do not have an answer. Now, if you look at that paragraph, Aristotle is merely just giving you an example of something that you may wish to explore to determine, to satisfy your intellectual curiosity. Whether or not that question has been resolved or not is not something that Aristotle takes in, up in this paragraph. But apparently the Rambam believes, either based on context or based upon his reading of the text, perhaps he had a slight variant of the text, we're not sure because we do know that the Rambam had access to Aristotelian writings from Arabic transcribers who translated it into Arabic. But the Rambam reads into this passage that Aristotle himself felt that this was an unresolved issue. And here the Rambam disagrees with one of the great ninth century um, Islamic philosophers, Abu Nasr al-Farabi, who saw this passage as a, as a definitive statement rather than a question. And the final irony that the Rambam offers at the end of this chapter is that some men who consider themselves wise are more prepared to follow the authority, and that word authority is a very, very important word um, uh, in the writing uh, of this chapter. They are prepared to follow the authority of philosophers more than the authority of prophets of God, since the prophets did not employ philosophical methodologies. Now, the word authority is in for some in some circles in this medieval world is a is a dirty word. Why is authority a dirty word? Because as Peter Abelard, who's a Christian philosopher who lives during the times of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, a century before the Rambam, as he writes, or not a full century, but um, but many years before the Rambam, he writes that it is wrong for a correct thinking theologian or philosopher to accept words on authority alone. What do we mean by authority? God said such and such, and therefore you must believe it. Of uh, Abelard, who was a devout Christian, but also a philosopher said, if the Bible is going to teach you something, you must make sure that it is not only acceptable to you based on the authority of God, but also based on the fact that it is intellectually sound. And that's what a philosopher does. And anyone who's going to try and synthesize their philosophical persona with their religious persona has to make sure that whatever they accept as being true is not based on authority alone, but it is rather based on the fact that it is intellectually proven or intellectually sound. And what the Rambam is lamenting is that many of these philosophers who are followers of Aristotle are prepared to accept something that Aristotle said on his authority because it remains unproven, this issue of the eternity of the, of the universe. They will, are more prepared to accept based on the fact that their guru, Aristotle, said it, even though it wasn't proved. What about the fact that the prophets of the Bible say that the universe was created and has not existed eternally? Well, they're not part of our philosophical circle. They don't use philosophical methodologies. So even though maybe you may not be so satisfied with Aristotle's proofs, but nonetheless, 
we put more uh, a stock in the authority of Aristotle than the authority of the prophets of God. And the concluding statement is only a few favored by the intellect have been guided aright through this latter method of reports coming from God because of their ability to discern a higher wisdom in the prophet's words. These are, this is the explanation that Rav Kafik gives. In other words, if you're truly a wise philosopher, you'll appreciate that even though the prophets do not speak in the same parlance and with the same elongated form of, of, um, of sophistry as the philosoph philosophical community does, there is tremendous depth of wisdom in their words. And if you're able to extract that wisdom, you'll realize that if you need to accept something on authority alone because you simply can't prove it, like something like, like the origins of the universe, you're much better off relying on the authority of the prophets than relying on the authority of even Arist the great Aristotle himself. Now, the Rambam concludes, we have yet to explain the creation account of the Torah, which we will do in chapters 25 through 27. In the ensuing chapters, the Rambam will elaborate on Aristotle, continuing to disprove it using different arguments, and that's something that we'll continue to see as time goes on. I hope you have a great rest of the week, and I hope that I was able to elucidate at least a little bit of this chapter. Have a great day.